I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. His blood still works and I'm glad to report that it never lost his power. Yes, he works. I've been redeemed by the blood.
The Lord's Supper is our scripture lesson for this evening. Our scripture lesson is found in Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. And it reads as follows in the NIV. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this season in which we celebrate your gift of your son, Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb of God. Thank you that your record in John 3.16 tells us that you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus, thank you that you told us in John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus, thank you that though you died on that old rugged cross, you rose to be at the right hand of the Father where you intercede for us. We love you and thank you for the sacrifice you made for us. Many seniors appreciate time spent with their grandchildren as opportunities to create memories. Memories can keep us connected to people, places, and experiences that have shaped us and influenced our lives. To be sure, we may at times wish we could forget certain things, but even in our most undesirable and unpleasant experiences, valuable life lessons can be formed through adversity. In our scripture tonight, Jesus created a memorable occasion for his closest followers as he calls for them to remember him. As Luke chapter 22 unfolds, Jesus at this last supper or communion with his disciples has just shared a meal with them and led them in the observance of Passover, the day that precedes the seven day feast of unleavened bread. This eight-day joint celebration, often called either Passover or Feast of Unleavened Bread, was the highlight of the year for the Jewish people in Jesus' day. Passover was one of the three festivals set aside for Jewish people to travel to the ancient temple in Jerusalem. Because the people traveled from near and far, these were called pilgrimage celebrations. Some Bible commentators estimate that as many as two million people could have been in attendance. The Passover looked back to the night before the Jewish people left their homes in Egypt on the way to the Promised Land. Exodus 12 records the first observance of the Passover in which God instructs his people to put the blood of one-year-old, unblemished, sacrificial lambs on the doorposts and above the door of their homes, so that when the angel of death saw the blood, he passed over that home to prevent their firstborn from being subjected to the judgment of God's tenth and final plague on the Egyptians. They were to eat a meal of bitter herbs with the roasted lamb and bread that was unleavened. 
because this Passover meal would be prepared in haste. No time to wait for leavening and bread to rise. The Jews were to put a belt on their waists, sandals on their feet, and a staff in their hands in a state of readiness to leave Egyptian bondage. So we see that Passover is the historical background for Jesus Christ establishing the Lord's Supper. This Passover lamb and the meal of unleavened bread became their permanent symbol of God's deliverance of his people from bondage. So the disciples would have understood the historical meaning of Christ's actions. But it was not until after the crucifixion and the resurrection that they would understand the transformation of what had been a Jewish feast of remembrance of God's deliverance into a new symbol for remembering Jesus' atoning sacrifice. Jesus' blood was the only acceptable sacrificial blood that could cover the sins of mankind once and for all time, giving men and women, boys and girls, the opportunity to be redeemed from eternal damnation and enter into a right relationship with God. So immediately following the Passover meal, Jesus instituted this sacred memorial so that his followers throughout the ages would remember him in his death. He first gave his disciples bread, a symbol of his body that was soon to be given for them. The cup then represented his precious blood that would be shed on Calvary's cross. Jesus spoke of the cup as the new covenant in his blood. The meaning is that it was Jesus's blood that would ratify or give an official sanction to this new covenant. The complete fulfillment of the new covenant, covenant will take place during the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ on earth. But as believers, we are entered into the good of it at this present time. The elements of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup, that is wine or grape juice, the fruit of the vine, were representative of God's blood and body. Jewish people were forbidden to eat blood and the disciples knew that Jesus was not speaking of literal blood, but of that which typified his blood. The elements are powerful symbols to remind us that Jesus came to dwell among us in the flesh. He really did suffer and die a shameful death on the cross, and what he did some 2,000 years ago impacts not only our lives today, but our eternity as well. John the Baptist in John chapter one, verse 29, cried out as Jesus approached him, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist certainly identified Jesus's coming as fulfillment of what the Passover lamb only foreshadowed. In Exodus 12, each lamb was sacrificed to deliver one family. At the cross, the lamb of God was sacrificed to deliver all of mankind from the power and penalty of sin. The Passover lamb was the substitute for the firstborn of Israel. But Jesus was our substitute at Calvary. Suffering the judgment of God would have befallen the Israelites without the death of the lamb and spreading its blood. For us, there would be no hope of salvation without the shedding of blood of Jesus 
and his substitutionary death. He who knew no sin, he was the unblemished Lamb of God. He who knew no sin became sin when he took our sins to the cross. A story is told of a young Kenyan girl, Monica, who broke her leg when she fell into a pit. An older woman who witnessed her fall climbed in to rescue her, not knowing that in the pit was a black mamba snake, the most poisonous snake in Africa. It bit both the child and Mama Najiri, her rescuer. Both were rushed to a medical center where Monica improved, but sadly, Mama Najiri died. A missionary explained that Mama Najiri was bitten first, so she received all of the snake's venom. The snake had no poison left when Monica was bitten. Jesus similarly took the poison of our sin through his death so that we can live. His was an act of passion done willingly, purposefully, and obediently in accord with the Father's divine plan. Jesus said in Luke 19, verse 10, that he came to seek and to save the lost. So as we gather around the Lord's table, the representative elements speak to us of Christ's sacrifice, his substitution, and our salvation. This is the powerful message of the gospel. Each time we observe the Lord's Supper, we come to celebrate our redemption in remembrance of him. At this last supper, Jesus said, this is my body given for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. His words are personalized. He told his disciples he was going to suffer for them, die for them, and this message is for believers ever after. It's true that Jesus' death was for all of mankind, for the sin of the world, but his disciples and we can hear him say, I am doing this for you. Jesus asked the disciples to eat the broken bread to remember him. He wanted them to remember his sacrifice, the basis for forgiveness of sins, and also for his friendship, which they could continue to enjoy through the work of the Holy Spirit. In Old Testament times, God agreed to forgive people's sins if they would bring animals for the priests to sacrifice. When this sacrificial system was begun, the covenant between God and his people was sealed with the blood of animals. That is found in Exodus 24, verse 8. But animal blood could not in itself re could remove sin. Only God can forgive sin. And animal sacrifices had to be repeated over and over and over again. Jesus instituted this new covenant between God and his people. Under this new covenant, Jesus would die in the place of sinners. Unlike animal blood, his blood, because he is God, would remove the sins of all who put their faith and trust in him. His sacrifice would never have to be repeated. His blood is good for eternity. 
Paul reminds us along with the Corinthian Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 of our personal salvation in Christ. That participation in this supper is accompanied by both inward and outward responsibility. We are to examine ourselves inwardly, spiritually, before we partake of the Lord's Supper. That examination requires us to sincerely and reverently humble ourselves, confessing sin in our hearts. Our outward participation formally declares through this act of communion our understanding and acknowledgement of Jesus' death for us until he comes again. As believers, may we forever be reminded of our God of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. The one and only God who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine according to his power at work in us. We are charged to remember Christ's redeeming sacrifice for us, not only as we partake in the Lord's Supper, but daily as we walk with him. Let us end in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose blood shed for our sins has wondrous working power in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for your willing obedience and submission to the Father's plan of redemption for mankind. Thank you, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you that your blood still works. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.